and a warm welcome to all of you for joining us today. We're honored to be able to bring you this special talk, and we hope you enjoy and benefit from it. As we welcome back our brothers and sisters from Hajj, and we listen to their moving stories, memories of the beauty of the Kaaba, and the crowding at Rabi al we don't always recall the backstory behind much of what Hajj is. Ernest Hemingway once said, when you love, you wish to do things for. You wish to sacrifice for, you wish to serve. And so today we will go back to centuries ago when Prophet Ibrahim loved and sacrificed for Allah, when he served and was rewarded with Allah's love and mercy. And with that, it is my honor to introduce our speaker of the day, Sister Yasmin Mujahid. Yasmin Mujahid received her bachelor's degree in psychology and her master's in journalism and mass communication from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. After completing her graduate work, she taught Islamic studies and served as the sister's youth director to the Islamic Society of Milwaukee. She also worked as a writing instructor for Cardinal Stritch University and a staff columnist for the Islamic section of In Focus News. Yasmeen just launched her new book, Reclaim Your Heart, which is now available worldwide, and a book signing will take place today after the lecture. Yasmeen is also currently an instructor for New Dawn Institute, a writer for the Huffington Post, and an internationally published author. Tune in live to Serenity, her show on One Legacy Radio, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern, as she discusses questions on faith, spirituality, and relationships from an Islamic spiritual lens. Visit her YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Mujahid online, and her website at ismeemujahid.com, where you can find a collection of her articles, posts, poetry, and lectures. Before we begin, I would just like to remind you all to refrain from asking questions until the end. We'll be passing out index cards. You might have already received them. And we'll take all your questions at the end, inshallah. And so with that, please welcome Sister Yasmin Mujahid. Uh, it's, it's always a little bit difficult to speak about the story of Prophet Ibrahim Ayyazadam because it's a, it's a very powerful story and um, I think a very personal one. Uh, Ibrahim Ayyazadam's story is, is a story of uh, really pure tawheed, monotheism. And a lot of times when we talk about monotheism, I don't think that we truly can, we don't truly capture the concept, really, of Tawheed and monotheism. Because usually when monotheism is described or defined, it's just defined as believing that there's one God. But Tawheed at the heart is much, much deeper than that, than just saying that there's one God or one creator. Tawheed at the root is a oneness in, in, in our ultimate love, in our ultimate fear, in our ultimate attachment, in our ultimate hope. It means that I'm putting God at the center of my existence. It means that when I'm most afraid, it's God who I turn to. It means that when I, I depend on something, it's God that I depend on most. It means that when I want something, it's God who I turn to, to ask for it. And it means that I realize that nothing happens in the entire world. Nothing happens, not even a leaf falling from a tree. Nothing happens in my life or your life or in the universe except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's only Allah that makes things happen. I don't make anything happen. If I decide to lift this book 
It isn't because I put in effort that it was lifted. It's by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it was lifted. Everything that happens is by Him. And what I do is is an action that I do. It's a means. I take a mean I take I take the means, but I don't control and I don't make results. Now the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam it begins uh, somewhat with a, a you know a child who and, and we're told this story where you know and you know this story where Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, you know again there's a difference of opinion about whether he's actually uh, thinking for a moment that the Ibrahim alayhi salam was always a muhad so when he's looking at the stars and he's looking at the sun and he's looking at the moon and he's saying, well, this must be my Lord. This, this, is, this, is a, this can be an, um, not to be taken literally, okay? But the lesson behind it is very, very deep for us to understand. When he looks at the sun and he said, okay, this is my Lord, but then the sun goes away. He said, no, this can't be my Lord because my Lord can't go away. He looks at the moon and, and says, you know, this is my Lord, but it goes away. My Lord can't set. The stars, the same thing. What can we learn from this story? Just that story alone. You know, when we go through life, there's a lot of things that we look at and we think, you know, this is it. Sometimes, you know, when we're young, it's our parents. You know, we get a little older, it's our career. Maybe it's our degree. It's this program, right? It's this university. It's this friend. It's this man or this woman. It's, it's my husband, it's my wife. And you look at those things, and we think this is our Lord. You know, um, really realizing here, Lord doesn't just mean something you pray to. It means the thing that you love most. It means the thing that you really place at the center of your existence. If you really want to understand this concept of ultimate attachment or ultimate love, or 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 the concept of an ilah. You ask yourself some very simple, practical questions. Ask yourself, what do you think about most in the day? What occupies your mind most throughout the day? Ask yourself, what occupies your mind when you start to pray? Sometimes there's these things that fill our minds all the time when we're praying. Ask yourself, what causes you the most distress? What causes you the most anxiety? What makes you cry most? What has the power to make you most happy? Now you'll find that the answer to these questions, it changes throughout your development. So you'll go through periods of time where maybe the answer to that question is your parents. Maybe then at some point it's your friends at school. And then it's your career, then it's your school, you're, in, you're, you're a student now, now it's med school, or it's, it's engineering school, or it's, it's my exams. And then you, you, know, you go to a phase where maybe it's your career, and it's your status in society. And then you go to a phase and maybe it's your family, it's your wife, or it's your husband, or it's your kids. And all of these things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran. إنما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولهو وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد. Here Allah is describing the life of this world in many as being many different things. The life of this world, He says, is play and amusement. Play and amusement, and boasting, and competing in children and wealth. And when we go back and we look at those things in our life that end up you know, taking over, right? We said the thing that we think about most, the thing that's most important to us, the thing that has the ability to make us cry, or to be afraid, or to, or to be happy. Those things also kind of follow that timeline, if you notice. When you're first entering this world, what's the most important thing to you? Life. Play. It's the most important thing to you. When you're a kid, that's it. You're happy if you get a new toy. You really couldn't care less for any other gift, right? If someone's going to give you a gift and they give you a sweater when you're five, 
you know what, you don't care. But if they give you a toy, then you're happy. And that's because your dunya in that, at that point in time is lie, it's, it's play, that's all that matters to you. And then you grow up a little bit and you're in you know, middle school and now, if someone were to give you a rattle or you know some sort of toy, you're not going to care so much. But if they give you a Game Boy or or, or a video game, you're going to be excited because now it's la. Now it's important to you. Your dunya at that point is la. It's amusement. It's entertainment. And then you get a little bit older, and you're in high school, and now it's zina. Now it's, it's adornment, it's, it's looking good. Because in, in high school, um, it just matters what you look like. It matters a lot what you look like. And this is the time when it takes like an hour and a half to get ready in the morning, right? Because you have to, you know, fix your hair if you're a guy, and hopefully your hijab if you're a girl. And the idea is that it really matters what you're wearing, it really matters what you look like. And then as you get older and you enter college, now, it, you know in college, it starts to matter a little less what you look like and a little more what you're accomplishing. And what school you got into versus others and what career you're building versus others. This is the boasting period. I got into this school, what did you get into? I got into this program, oh, I, I got this job offer, what did you, so now we're boasting and that's what matters. And it won't matter so much to you if you got a toy, it won't matter so much to you if you got a video game, it won't matter so much to you how much you're wearing, but it matters to you that you're competing in, in this, in, 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 and boasting about you know, what program one or another got into. And then as you get older, and now you're starting to settle down and you're starting to have a family, now the competition becomes a little different. And now what matters is تَفَاخُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ تَكَاثُرٌ Excuse me. تَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Meaning that now there's a competition in money, in wealth, who has the nicer house, who has the nicer car, who has the bigger house? When aulad. And now we start to compete in our children. As you get older and now you have kids, now the competition is, what's your kid doing? Well, you know what my kid's doing. What's, what school did your kid get into? Well, you know what school my kid got into. Or how much did your kid's uh, wedding cost? How much is my kid's wedding costing? Competition. All of these things, Allah says, this is all the mata of dunya. This is all the, just the, the fleeting pleasures of dunya. This isn't the real thing. But these are the things that we run after. And Allah describes this as a garden that makes the gardener or the farmer really happy for a moment. You know when you grow something and it looks really beautiful for a moment. You get, you know, someone brings you flowers. Flowers are gorgeous for about three days, four days, maybe a week if you really take care of them. But then what happens to those flowers? Allah describes this in the Qur'an. And He says that they start to wither, and then they start to become hard, you know, crumble. And eventually, you know, these things can just, you can take that, what used to be the most beautiful flower, and just crumble it, and it just blows in the wind. Allah is giving us an analogy here, that this is dunya. That these things that we run after of dunya, whether it's the play, or the amusement, or the adornment, or the boasting, or the competition in wealth and children, it's all passing away. That isn't what it's about. That isn't what's lasting. And then Allah says that after all of that, it's either Jannah or Jahannam. We have to be able to, to look past these these illusionary things which end up becoming our world at different stages in time. And, and everybody in this room is at a different stage of those things. But the reality is we're, we're, we're typically in one of those categories at some point. 
whether it's people or it's our jobs or it's status or it's wealth, but what happens is we take other things and we love them as we should only love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Ibrahim salam is looking at the different creations of Allah and he's, he's recognizing that this cannot be his Lord because it passes away, that's a lesson for us. Our money cannot be our Lord because it passes away. Our status cannot be our Lord because it passes away. Our beauty cannot be our Lord because it passes away. Our relationships cannot be our Lord because it passes away. Our play and our amusement and our boasting and our, our, our degrees and our status, all these things are temporary. So they cannot be our Lord because they pass away, because they set. And our Lord never sets, as Ibrahim salam saw. That he, you know, there's a very deep lesson in this. All that sets cannot be your Lord. And Allah has shown us this lesson in our life if we're paying attention. If you reflect on your life, and the longer you live in this world, the longer, the more you learn of this, is that the things that you attached yourself to, the things that you put at the center of your life, they, they changed, they passed away, they let you down. These are not where we should put our ultimate dependency and our ultimate love and our ultimate fear and our ultimate hope. So Ibrahim is, is, is being raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's being trained. He then has another aspect of his sort of training, and this is that they're now going to join together and throw him in the fire. That's pretty scary to think that you're going to be thrown in, into the fire, right? But Ibrahim salam, look at his level of trust and his level of tawheed. Again, it comes back to tawheed. Ibrahim salam, knows who controls the fire. Remember I said if I lift up this book, I don't make it go up. Allah does. Allah is the one who controls everything. Allah also controls the fire. So how is he going to fear the fire when he knows Allah controls it? Whatever happens to him is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he's going to be thrown into the fire, his response is, Hasbi Allah wa ni'man wakil. Allah is sufficient for me. And he is the best of protectors or trustees. That's his response. And it's very similar to the response of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa is standing in front of the Red Sea and he looks completely trapped. You can imagine that Musa alayhi salam, his situation is he has a superpower army behind him. And he has the barrier of a giant body of water in front of him. So he would look pretty trapped. And if we were in that situation, we'd feel pretty trapped. And in fact, we have been in, in situations where we have felt very trapped. Even though we aren't dealing with Pharaoh, even though we aren't dealing with the Red Sea, we aren't dealing with an army, but we have felt trapped in our lives. And we learn from the reaction and the response of, of, these, of these amazing people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he said, Musa salam says, when the people around him told him, now we're going to be overtaken. قَالَ كَلَّا إِنَّ مَعَيَ رَبِّي سَيَهْدِينَ He said, by no means. Indeed, my Lord is with me and he will guide me through. Now realize that Musa salam did not actually see with his physical eyes a way out of his situation, right? There was no way out that one could imagine out of such a situation. You're stuck in front of the Red Sea and you have Pharaoh and his army behind you. Where can you possibly go? Where can you possibly escape? Have you ever felt that way? Where you're in a situation and you cannot imagine any way out. But there is always a way out, and it's through a way that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, and only Allah can make for you. So look at his response. Even though his physical eyes didn't see a way out, his heart saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
His heart saw the way out that only Allah could make. And he said, Kalla inna maya rabbi sayahdeen. His tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to take his staff and to strike the sea. And Allah opened up the Red Sea. There is a lesson for this. And there's a, there's a lesson for all of us in this story. First, I want us to begin to understand that the stories were told in the, in the Qur'an and by the Prophet are not just stories. They're not just stories that we tell our children you know, as a bedtime story to go to sleep. They're not just stories that we learned in Sunday school and we just you know, repeat. These stories, Allah chooses to tell us very specifically and for a very specific purpose. And they are lessons for us. And Allah actually, after telling this particular story, Allah goes on to say that in this is a sign, but most people don't understand. Most people don't believe in these signs or understand these signs. Allah says this is a sign. Now Ibrahim had a very similar reaction. He's about to be thrown in the fire, but he has complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he knows who controls the fire. And we're told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cooled the fire for Ibrahim And there's also um, a narration that tells us, and this is just so powerful, that before he was going to be thrown in the fire, Jibreel alayhi came to him and asked him, do you need anything? And you can imagine, again, us being in this situation, like, um, Yes, <laughs> get me out of here. Like, 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 why am I still in this situation? You know, and this, I'm gonna like bring this inshallah home. You know, we're in a really, really difficult situation, and there might be, you know, some other way out. But you know what he says? He says, "Not from you." I want you to reflect on that for a moment. Jibreel Ali Salam is saying, "Do you need anything?" Can I help you? You know, do you need help? And he said, not from you. Because he knew that his help only came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it said that after that, Allah made the, the, the fire cool for him. Now the training of Ibrahim continues because after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with something that he loved so much, and that is his son, Ismail. And so now, again, what did we say? Ibrahim Salam's story is a story of Tawheed, right? And so now he's being given something that he loves so much. But that's the thing about when we love something so much, it can become a competitor in our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the fitna of it. Because Allah says that in your spouses and in your children is a fitna. He says, Allah says this in the Quran, that in your spouse and in your children is a fitna. And fitna, it, it, one of the meanings of fitna is it's a test. Because we have this, it, it becomes now, okay, now I have this child. And now it becomes a, a, a test for me. Is my life now going to revolve around this child? Or is my life going to revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, now I have this money. Is my life now going to revolve around this money, or is my life going to still be centered and revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, now I have this career, but is my life now going to revolve around that career, or is it going to revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, now I have this husband, or now I have this wife, but is my life now going to revolve around that husband or that wife, or is it going to revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? These are tests. We are tested in those things that we love. So Ibrahim is also tested by that which he loves. And that's Ismail. So Ibrahim 
Alisalam has a dream that he is sacrificing his son Ismail. And we know that you know, for the prophets, peace be upon their dreams are wahi, are revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has this dream, and he says to Ismail salam, about his dream. And he knows that this is now, this is wahi, this is revelation, it's a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now first of all, and this isn't always focused on, but look at the response of Ismail salam, too. Not only did Ibrahim salam, submit to the command of Allah, so did Ismail salam. So it's one thing for a father to sacrifice his own son, and it's another thing for the son to say, yes, go ahead, right? So he also said, yes, go ahead. He also submitted to the, to the uh, commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They both did. And when he went then to sacrifice him, as you know the story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he didn't make that happen, and he, instead he gave him the, the sheep or the lamb to sacrifice, and this is what we do to commemorate um, during the time of, of Hajj. But there's something, you know, to reflect on in this story. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want Ibrahim salam, to kill his son? No, obviously not. What was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not slaughtering Ibrahim, was not slaughtering Ismail alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was slaughtering any false attachment, any source of competition that could have been in the heart of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because if it was anything, it, it might have been Ismail, or anything close. And what that did is it again made the heart of Isma Ibrahim alayhi salam a heart of Tawheed. There's nothing in his heart that he loves as he should only love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not even the most beloved thing to him, which was Ismail alayhi salam. And this is the lesson of Ibrahim alayhi salam when he says, إِنِّي وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِي لِلَّذِي فَطْرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ that I have indeed turned my face, Hanifa, completely. This complete turning of the face, not just this face, but the face of your heart, completely turning it, only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ma ana min al-mushrikeen. And there was no shirk. Again, remember that that shirk, and I want, this is the message really I want to get across, inshallah. That shirk, it's not just that I call and you know I make dua to someone other than Allah or I bow to someone other than Allah. There is shirk in love. There is shirk in fear. There is shirk in hope. There is shirk in these things that we put our dependencies on. When my dependency is on the money that's in my bank, that's a form of shirk. Because my dependency is on something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course there's levels in shirk. But that is a form of shirk. We were talking about pure tawheed. And when my dependency is on another person, when we answer these questions that I asked you, what do you think about all day long? What do you think about most? What makes you cry? What are you most afraid of? Where do you really put your hope? And if the answer is something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if it's your job, or your husband, or your wife, or your kids, if it's any other thing, then we have to know that there's a problem in our tawheed. Because those things are supposed to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's really the meaning of la ilaha illallah. There is no ilah except Allah, and ilah is not just something you worship as in praying. And ilah is not just something you pray to. And ilah is that which you put at the center of your life. It is that which is on your mind most. It is that which you find refuge in most and what you turn to most and what you put your ultimate dependency on. It is that which you love most and what you fear most and what you hope in most. That's an ilah. Now, 
we go on and there is another really beautiful aspect of the story. And this is the story of Hajar. So the story then continues, and this is again a story of Tawheed. And Tawheed breeds Tawakkul, by the way, because Tawakkul is trust and reliance. If you know, truly know, that it is only Allah who controls all the matters in your life and all the matters in the heavens and the earth, how can you put your trust anywhere else? Would it make sense, right? You know, it's kind of like you know that the, the king is in charge of everything that happens in the kingdom, or the president is in charge of everything that happens in that country, and yet you go to the servant and you ask for everything you need from the servant. It doesn't make sense. No one does that. You don't go and ask for your needs from the servant when you know the king is in charge, right? We know, if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge, and that's part of your iman and your tawheed, then tawakkul, trust, is, is just, it's a natural consequence of that. So you find that when Hajar is taken to the, the middle of the desert, again, this, is, this was also part of, of every, you know, this is, this is the, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's taken to the desert with her child, with Ismail alayhi salam, and she's left there. Again, look at the tawakkul, not only of Ibrahim alayhi that he's able, I mean, how easy would that be? To take your wife and like newborn child and leave them in the middle of the desert? That's his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, I want you guys to really take this and understand how it applies to you. These are not just stories. Yes, we're not going to have to take our families, most probably, and leave them in the middle of the desert. But yes, we are going to be in situations where we do have to put our trust in Allah. In situations where we don't see a way out. In situations where we don't know where the provision is going to come from. In situations where we don't know where the protection is going to come from, but we know that Allah will take care of it. And we do our part but we know that the protection and the provision comes from him. So he takes that and he's able to do that and to walk away. And then she is also able to be patient and accept that. I mean, how many people would accept that? Like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Leaving me and this baby in the middle of the desert? That's not, that's not how she responded. She, she also had tawakkul, like Ismail alayhi salam, when he was... Um, you know, when he was told about the dream. And I mean, this is, of course, this is what Ismail was a baby, and this isn't the order that it happened, but these are all individual lessons for us. In this story, then he's left, she's left, and now she's in a situation where there, you know, a desert, middle of the desert, there's no water. And without water, you know, we, we, we go, we die. Right? We, we would dehydrate and die, her and her child. So what does she do at this point? And there's a lot of lessons in this. One is a lesson of working hard, of striving. Because we know that she was in a state of tawakkul. Because she didn't argue about her being left there. But at the same time, she didn't just sit either. She didn't just sit in the desert and wait for the water to come out of the sky. So this is a lesson in and of itself. Tawakkul is an act or a state of the heart. It isn't a state of the limbs. So saying that I tawakkaltu ala Allah, that I have tawakkul on Allah, that I have reliance on Allah, that I am, I am trusting in Allah, doesn't mean that you don't act with your limbs, with your actions. It means that your heart is in a state of tawakkul. Your heart is in a state of reliance even though you're acting simultaneously. This, this common uh, hadith that you heard of, that you hear about tawakkul, tie your camel securely and put your trust in Allah. You do the two at the same time. Tawakkul is an, is an act of the heart. It's a state of the heart that I'm entrusting my, whatever happens, Allah will take care of it, but I'm doing my part also. So she gets up and she starts running. She starts running 
So she's, she's on Safa, she goes up to Safa, and she's looking for water, and she doesn't find. She runs to Marwa, she's looking for water, and she doesn't find. Notice here first how she's struggling, and how she's striving, and how she's trying. And she's, this, this act of running between Safa and Marwa, the act itself is called Sa'i. Sa'i means to strive. She's working hard, even though her heart is in tawakkul, but she's still working hard. Now notice that she's tried Safa and she's tried Marwa, and she didn't find any water. And then, at this point, let me ask you this. When you've tried something and it failed, it didn't work, what is typically our response to that? What do we typically do? We typically give up. Well, I've already tried that, it didn't work, right? We give up at that point. Ah, I'm going to give up now. And we become maybe hopeless. But she didn't give up. In fact, she went right back to where she had already checked. And she had already tried. She's doing the same thing again. She's still trying, she still has hope, she doesn't give up. She goes back to Safa and checks again. And notice, you know, when we do this side business, when we do side, we typically, most of us, walk. She's not walking, she's running. And not only is she running, but it's not like so comfortable as it is now for us, you know, like the marble floors and they're white and they're cool and alhamdulillah. She's in the middle of a desert, no cover, you know what I'm saying? And she's, that's how hard she's working. And she goes back and she again doesn't find water. At this point, she's now tried Safa twice, Marwa once, still doesn't give up. And she goes back again to Marwa. Now she's checked Marwa, again no water. <coughs> Safa twice, Marwa twice. Imagine at this point, okay, maybe you might try something a couple times, it fails. At that point, of course we give up, right? She still doesn't give up. So there's, there's such a lesson in this of, of not losing hope, of not giving up, and keeping that, you know, again, your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He will send the result, that He will send the water, that He will open up the situation, but she just don't give up. And she goes again back, she does this seven times. Seven times. It is important to notice, I mean it's not a coincidence that she's repeating the same behavior throughout this. She could have been going from mountain to mountain, all different, you know, running all in different places and then the water came. No, it's repetition. Repetition and constancy and not giving up is a central part of tazkiyah, a central part of, of personal development. It's a central part of our deen. I mean, when we pray, we're doing the same thing over and over. When we say tasbih, when we're saying subhanAllah, we're saying the same thing over and over. Right? When we do dhikr, it's the same thing again. How many times do we say fatiha in a day? How many same times do we say ya ilaha illallah? How many times do we say subhanAllah? Why are we repeating it again and again? We have to know there's a wisdom in this repetition. It's, it, it's through that that we are developed. And it's through not giving up and it's through patience. Because patience is about, yeah, you try the same thing again and again, even though it doesn't work, you try it again. And you have, you have hope and you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will send the way out. He will send the result. He will send the water. He will open up the sea, right? Open up the Red Sea, but you have to have that trust and that patience. So after that, seven times, she, now notice this, and this is also a lesson from her story, is where does the water come from? The water comes from under the foot of Ismail, from the sand. Now that's miraculous, of course, right? Water doesn't typically come out of sand. You know, uh, Red Seas don't typically split down the middle. But let me ask you this question. Did her striving, her 
actions, her um, deeds, are they directly what made the water come from the sand? When you go and you decide, when you say you go to the middle of the desert and you start running between mountains, is it going to make water come from the sand? No. If you take a stick and you hit, you know, the, the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or any sea or any river for that matter, is it going to split down the middle? What's the point here? The point here is that, yes, I do my part, but the result doesn't come from me. The result doesn't come from my actions, from my deeds. The result comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's really important because one of the problems we have is we rely on our own actions, our own deeds to make things happen. I have to do this because I'm making things happen. And we put, as a result of that, we actually put so much pressure on ourselves. And it's, it's crushing because we feel this responsibility that I have to make things happen. And it's no wonder that we then you know, suffer from anxiety and all these things, because we have, we have forgotten where things come from. So there is this balance. It doesn't mean that you don't act, because Hajar acted very much. She strove hard. Musa salam, acted. He had an action that he did. He took his staff and he struck the Red Sea. But by no means does striking a sea with a staff make it split. Allah made it split. And Allah made water come from the sand. So in these things, subhanAllah, are amazing, timeless lessons for us. And I hope that inshallah, if there's anything that I said that was beneficial, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And anything that I said that was wrong is from myself and I seek protection um, and forgiveness for that. قولي قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك ونتوب إليك جزاك الله خير. So we'll be taking your questions right now. So there are index cards being passed around. If you already have yours filled out. Um, We'll be collecting those too, so. Uh, just a few announcements before we take your questions. We will be holding a book signing after we finish, and it's going to be in this building. And after the book signing, we'll also be playing Asr, inshallah. And IITMSA will also be holding a night party next week, and that is Right? You know, it's kind of like you know that the, the king is in charge of everything that happens in the kingdom, or the president is in charge of everything that happens in that country, and yet you go to the servant and you ask for everything you need from the servant. It doesn't make sense. No one does that. You don't go and ask for your needs from the servant when you know the king is in charge, right? We know, if you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge, and that's part of your iman and your tawheed, then tawakkul, trust, is, is just, it's a natural consequence of that. So you find that when Hajar is taken to the, the middle of the desert, again, this, is, this was also part of, of every, you know, this is, this is the, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's taken to the desert with her child, with Ismail alayhi salam, and she's left there. Again, look at the tawakkul, not only of Ibrahim alayhi that he's able, I mean, how easy would that be? To take your wife and like newborn child and leave them in the middle of the desert? That's his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, I want you guys to really take this and understand how it applies to you. These are not just stories. Yes, we're not going to have to take our families, most probably, and leave them in the middle of the desert. But yes, we are going to be in situations where we do have to put our trust in Allah. In situations where we don't see a way out. In situations where we don't know where the provision is going to come from. In situations where we don't know where the protection is going to come from, but we know that Allah will take care of it. And we do our part. 
but we know that the protection and the provision comes from him. So he takes that and he's able to do that and to walk away. And then she is also able to be patient and accept that. I mean, how many people would accept that? Like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Leaving me and this baby in the middle of the desert. That's not, that's not how she responded. She, she also had tawakkul. Like Ismail alayhi salam, when he was, um, you know, when he was told about the dream. And I mean, this is, of course, this is what Ismail was a baby, and this isn't the order that it happened, but these are all individual lessons for us. In this story, then he's left, she's left, and now she's in a situation where there, you know, a desert, middle of the desert, there's no water. And without water, you know, we, we, we go, we die. Right? We, we would dehydrate and die, her and her child. So what does she do at this point? And there's a lot of lessons in this. One is a lesson of working hard, of striving. Because we know that she was in a state of tawakkul. Because she didn't argue about her being left there, but at the same time, she didn't just sit either. She didn't just sit in the desert and wait for the water to come out of the sky. So this is a lesson in and of itself. Tawakkul is an act or a state of the heart. It isn't a state of the limbs. So saying that I tawakkaltu ala Allah, that I have tawakkul on Allah, that I have reliance on Allah, that I am, I am trusting in Allah, doesn't mean that you don't act with your limbs, with your actions. It means that your heart is in a state of tawakkul. Your heart is in a state of reliance, even though you're acting simultaneously. This, this common uh, hadith that you heard of, that you hear about tawakkul, tie your camel securely and put your trust in Allah. You do the two at the same time. Tawakkul is an, is an act of the heart. It's a state of the heart that I am entrusting my, whatever happens, Allah will take care of it, but I'm doing my part also. So she gets up and she starts running. She starts running. So she's, she's on Safa, she goes up to Safa, and she's looking for water, and she doesn't find. She runs to Marwa, she's looking for water, and she doesn't find. Notice here first how she's struggling, and how she's striving, and how she's trying. And she's, this, this act of running between Safa and Marwa, the act itself is called Sa'i. Sa'i means to strive. She's working hard, even though her heart is in tawakkul, but she's still working hard. Now notice that she's tried Safa and she's tried Marwa, and she didn't find any water. And then, at this point, let me ask you this. When you've tried something and it failed, it didn't work, what is typically our response to that? What do we typically do? We typically give up. Well, I've already tried that, it didn't work, right? We give up at that point. Ah, I'm going to give up now. And we become maybe hopeless. But she didn't give up. In fact, she went right back to where she had already checked. And she had already tried. She's doing the same thing again. She's still trying, she still has hope, she doesn't give up. She goes back to Safa and checks again. And notice, you know, when we do this side business, when we do side, we typically, most of us, walk. She's not walking, she's running. And not only is she running, but it's not like so comfortable as it is now for us, you know, like the marble floors and they're white and they're cool and alhamdulillah. She's in the middle of a desert, no cover, you know what I'm saying? And she's, that's how hard she's working. And she goes back and she again doesn't find water. At this point, she's now tried Safa twice, Marwa once, still doesn't give up. And she goes back again to Marwa. Now she's checked Marwa, again no water, <coughs> Safa twice, Marwa twice. Imagine at this point, okay, maybe you might try something a couple times, 
it fails, at that point, of course we give up, right? She still doesn't give up. So there's, there's such a lesson in this of, of not losing hope, of not giving up, and keeping that, you know, again, your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he will send the result, that he will send the water, that he will open up the situation, but she just don't give up. And she goes again back, she does this seven times. Seven times. It is important to notice, I mean it's not a coincidence that she's repeating the same behavior throughout this. She could have been going from mountain to mountain, all different, you know, running all in different places and then the water came. No, it's repetition. Repetition and constancy and not giving up is a central part of tazkiyah, a central part of, of personal development. It's a central part of our deen. I mean, when we pray, we're doing the same thing over and over. When we say tasbih, when we're saying subhanAllah, we're saying the same thing over and over, right? When we do dhikr, it's the same thing again. How many times do we say fatiha in a day? How many same times do we say la ilaha illallah? How many times do we say subhanAllah? Why are we repeating it again and again? We have to know there's a wisdom in this repetition. It's, it, it's through that that we are developed. And it's through not giving up and it's through patience. Because patience is about, yeah, you try the same thing again and again, even though it doesn't work, you try it again. And you have, you have hope and you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will send the way out. He will send the result. He will send the water. He will open up the sea, right? Open up the Red Sea, but you have to have that trust and that patience. So after that, seven times, she, now notice this, and this is also a lesson from her story, is where does the water come from? The water comes from under the foot of Ismail, from the sand. Now that's miraculous, of course, right? Water doesn't typically come out of sand. You know, uh, Red Seas don't typically split down the middle. But let me ask you this question. Did her striving, her actions, her um, deeds, are they directly what made the water come from the sand? When you go and you do sign, when you say you go to the middle of the desert and you start running between mountains, is it gonna make water come from the sand? No. If you take a stick and you hit, you know, the, the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean or any sea or any river for that matter, is it going to split down the middle? What's the point here? The point here is that, yes, I do my part, but the result doesn't come from me. The result doesn't come from my actions, from my deeds. The result comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's really important because one of the problems we have is we rely on our own actions, our own deeds to make things happen. I have to do this because I'm making things happen. And we put, as a result of that, we actually put so much pressure on ourselves. And it's, it's crushing because we feel this responsibility that I have to make things happen. And it's no wonder that we then you know, suffer from anxiety and all these things because we have, we have forgotten where things come from. So there is this balance. It doesn't mean that you don't act, because Hajar acted very much. She strove hard. Musa salam, acted. He had an action that he did. He took his staff and he struck the Red Sea, but by no means does striking a sea with a staff make it split. Allah made it split. And Allah made water come from the sand. So in these things, subhanAllah, are um, amazing, timeless lessons for us. And I hope that inshallah, if there's anything that I said that was beneficial, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And anything that I said that was wrong is from myself, and I seek protection um, and forgiveness for it.